Hey everyone, Arshawn McBride here, joined with uh, Deirdre Watson, who's my co-host on these shows, and then also expert Heather Reed, who's going to be talking about uh, events, event planning, and cancellation. So what's happened is, what happens in a lot of issues, you know, those of you that have seen my shows before know me, uh, when something bad happens in business, people usually run to the file drawer, run to their computer files, and they open their contracts again. <laughs> they usually don't look at them until something bad happens, but that's where everybody goes and looks at their LLC agreement, or they look at their sales agreement, or they look at their employment agreement, uh, and then we figure out what happens. But, you know, uh, in a perfect world, we would all be planning as we go, and so I think Heather's going to bring some of those themes in there. Um, Heather, why don't you just take a minute and tell us a little bit about who you are and uh, what you've been doing, and then we'll kind of jump into some questions that might help some of our viewers. Sure. Thank you, Sean. Uh, and hello, Deidre. Uh, I have been an independent meeting planner here in uh, London, Ontario area, uh, Canada, for the last 25 plus years. I have run my own business, um, had not-for-profit and association clients uh, as a meeting planner. And uh, I've always been uh, a, f a learner of the event contracts, so the venue contracts particularly. Um, my very first contract um, was a convention center contract uh, that was 22 pages long. Yep. And uh, I... A, I was an accidental planner at that point. I was had walked out of graduate school and uh, took on this uh, national association as uh, their national administrator. And part of the role at that time was to negotiate their, their conference uh, contract. And I became quickly very, very scared of, of what was uh, included in that contract, those 22 pages. Um, and from there, I just spent years trying to learn everything I could uh, to protect my clients. Uh, my clients looked to me to be the expert in um, all of the different areas of being uh, an event planner and contracts to me were a very important one. And then in about 2014, I started to realize that um, I actually overheard a colleague say, I didn't know you could negotiate force majeure. And I was one of, I'm not an overly subtle person and I kind of whipped around and went, what? This person that I really respect was saying, I didn't know you could negotiate force majeure. And that was kind of one of those light bulb moments where I realized that what I knew um, as far as depth of contract knowledge was perhaps not shared with others um, in my similar role. And I've always said that, you know, no one ever hired me to be the creative for an event. We all have our own areas of expertise and our own areas of interest. Um, mine are not on the creative side. I'm very much wired the academic side. And so I realized that there was an opportunity to share what I had learned over the years by taking courses and primarily actually um, thanks to a lot of the American hospitality lawyers over the years that are very generous in sharing um, their expertise. And, and what works in the hospitality industry. Um, and so I started Planner Protect uh, formally in 2016. And so now I work um, most of, of a full week. Uh, I still am a planner. Um, I still have clients, but uh, I work with uh, individuals or event hosts or event planners and help them negotiate the very best contracts that they can um, negotiate from either a hotel or a convention center or um, an untraditional kind of venue like a museum or um, a recreation center, that sort of thing. So I work with them to really uh, negotiate a balanced contract. And I like the word balanced because it's not about one side or the other winning. It's about creating a win-win as best you can. Um, both parties deserve, in my opinion, when you're entering a business agreement, both parties deserve to be protected. Sure. Um, and so when we are presented with a typical hotel contract or a typical convention center contract, they've been created by their legal counsel to protect them. Yeah. And we, as event hosts, have to be almost as savvy as they are in l trying to negotiate what works for us and trying to find that balance between the two sides. Right. And so well, that's my well, role at Planner Protect. Yeah, let me pause and underscore a point there, which is you said, you know, the contract's drafted in their favor, right? And that's something that the attorneys know that I think a lot of people don't bring home, which is, 
usually the person who writes the contract is going to write it in their favor. Absolutely. So, so and I don't, I don't think, and it's just one of those things that the legal community all knows that that's our duty, right? So anytime a lawyer has a client, our duty is to do what's best for our client. Yes. Which means if I'm writing a contract, I have to write the best contract for them. Now I have to make the contract reasonable enough that the other person will hopefully sign it. But as I'm writing it, I'm trying to think, you know, how's my client impacted from this? Which would be the better way to have this situation work out? So, you know, in the case of if I'm a venue lawyer and I'm doing a force majeure provision, I want to make that as narrow as possible, right? I want Absolutely. things mm -hmm. to be in there as possible. And if you're on, say, say Deidre's side, let's bring her in here. You know, she wants that force majeure to be as broad as possible, right? She wants to yes. get everything she possibly can so that she has more likelihood if something bad happens that she can then, you know, postpone or cancel or change the event. Right, Deirdre? Oh, definitely. And a number of years ago, I was uh, brought on to a, a, uh, a conference and I was not involved in the site selection or the contract negotiation. So it was, you know, one of the last minute, hey, let's call Deirdre. Um, worked out great, but we found out um, six weeks before the conference that the venue was going to be doing major demolition mm. and there was no there wasn't any force majeure or any con construction clause in the contract yep well and it's in and, and in all fairness i as you said sean the the contracts are written to protect the party that created the contract and so it's you know it's up to us if we don't have our own contract to present to the venue which some large I, I know i work with some clients that have created their own contracts and and their philosophy is if you want me to come into your place of business and host my event that this is the contract that i expect uh, but for the most part most events don't have that kind of ammunition <laughs> um, and that kind of leverage to say you know if you want me in your building um, and we rely on the contract being presented to us and so uh, it's all about us then knowing what are the gaps where what are the the clauses that you know the venue knows that they can be put in but they don't offer them and and I think one of the um, and I say this often and dear just heard me say it I uh, that one of the light bulb moments for me really truly was when I learned that one of the major chains at one point had 16 pages of attrition clauses to choose from. And when I learned that I went, oh my goodness, why would we ever accept the very first version of a clause that's presented to us? They're giving us the one that is most risk uh, least risk adverse for them and we have to find one in that 16 pages of, of attrition charges that work for us and so it really is about knowing what questions to ask mm -hmm. it's knowing you know having a master checklist to say you know have has the contract addressed this has it addressed this has it addressed this and and you know I, I think for the most part, planners uh, are incredibly busy people. We're on number five on the list of most stressful jobs for a reason is because we just deal with thousands of details and contracts require us to pause and be calm and have time. Uh, to get through a contract takes hours and hours of focus and most planners just don't have that kind of time and and so we go through it and we go dates space rates concessions good and yep. then we cross our fingers and and hope right for the rest of it so right I had, a, I had another lawyer when I was a when I was a young lawyer they told me what they would do is they would read the contract to about 75 percent of the way through and 75 percent of the way through is where you start getting to the you know boiler <laughs> the contract you know, you would get the things that can be very important. Indemnity, who picks up a yes. liability, who picks up a loss, right. you know, the force majeure provisions. There's some very important stuff in the boilerplate. And a lot of people just say, oh, well, that's boilerplate. It gets in every, well, it gets in every contract, but the wording's different, right? The, you could actually change those wording. Yes. It makes a big difference. So, you know, their yeah. advice to me as a young lawyer was, look, read through to about 75%. That's where you get all your commercial terms, all the things that are custom to that deal. And then when you get to the back quarter, stop, you know, take a break, then read the back quarter very closely because there'll be a lot of details buried in there. 
Well, actually, it's uh, John Foster, who is one of my greatest heroes. He's an American lawyer, hospitality lawyer, who for years has been very prolific in what he's been writing. And he's a real advocate for the event host side. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, he, he said years ago, he said, you need to read a contract three times. One, mm -hmm. the first time is just to get the lay of the land. What is, what is it saying? The second time is to really look at where am I being asked to assume responsibility? So where am I being on the hook, so to speak, for um, financial commitments, deadlines, um, you know, any number of things? And then he said, and it, it, it just was like, wow, okay. He said the third time through, you have to read it for what is missing. Um, and you have to look at it and say, I'm not just reading the words that are here. I'm reading it with the intent of finding out what is missing. Um, and, and that really, it made me realize, okay, I can't just trust what's on the paper. I have to have my own measure, so to speak, to say, you know, what do I need to put back in that contract? So one of the things um, is around cancellation. So a lot of groups right now are dealing with, is it force majeure, impossibility, frustration of purpose, that sort of thing, or is it outright cancellation? Um, and weeks ago, when it was kind of that gray area, like we're now into a position where it's truly, you know, um, there are lots of, of reasons to, um, to create force majeure, right? To, to explain and to, and to defend force majeure. However, in the first few weeks, it was about groups that were getting skittish and concerned and worried. Um, and they weren't necessarily looking at, they didn't have the, the, um, the, the legal premise for force majeure, but they were being pressured for the optics of hosting an event in the next few weeks. And it was about cancellation. And, uh, and that causes you to go back to your cancellation language. And, um, and so one of the things that's always missing in a contract is, well, what if it happens on the other side? What if it's not about the event that has to cancel? What if it's about the venue that has to cancel? Right. Um, and that's rarely in a contract, and yet it's so equally important. Um, and so what happens if after COVID and things are starting to come back online and you've weathered the storm, but what if your venue is closed still? What if they've not been able to get back up to speed as quickly as you might have expected? And they're the ones that are, are causing the cancellation. Yes. What is in the contract for you as a group that had in good faith looked to move forward and now the venue can't, are there damages for the group, right? Yeah. So there's just so many things that, that need to be balanced. Yeah, and there's, there's a concept out there, you know, called efficient breach of contract, right? So actually, sometimes it actually makes sense to breach a contract. And I think where events need to be very careful about is from a venue standpoint, especially with this period that we're going into in the fall. We have a lot of events yes. that are scheduled. We have a lot of events that are going to be rescheduled. We have a lot of uncertainty on timing. Yes, there may be a venue or two out there that does the math and says, well, look, I've got your group coming in and you're paying me $200,000. But this other person just said that they need my space and they'll pay me a million dollars. I'm just going to break the $200,000 contract and I'll take the consequences. Yeah, it's going to happen. Gonna Absolutely. It's a million dollar deal, right? And well, just, and yeah, yeah. That, and that's a scary place to be if you have nothing in your contract that that prevented or or uh, not prevented that's not the right word sorry that that um, uh, made you whole as a group if, if there's nothing in it that says that if the venue cancels or breaches the contract that they don't make you whole like we're as event hosts we're held to very high standards if we breach or cancel and yet those same um, privileges, if you want to call them that, are not there for the event host. Yeah. Um, I, several years ago, I, an association, a Canadian association, literally was informed in an email that their venue was closing down for construction. And their conference was a year later, and it was a half a million dollar piece of business that had no language in the contract that protected them should the venue want to close. And it ended up costing that association $10,000 to relocate and reconfigure their event and no damages, no skin in the game from the venue perspective. Um, and so, yeah, and, and unfortunately in this time, we have yet to see what's gonna play out, right? We have, have yet to see what's gonna happen with, with all of- uh, We're gonna see a lot of those dominoes fall and we just don't know mm -hmm. how they're gonna fall. How they're gonna fall, yep. Well, right. do you, um, let me ask you, Heather, in regards to all the cancellations, 
And of course, we know that it's very difficult to uh, renegotiate an already existing contract. I've actually done it. Um, it wasn't easy, but I've done it. Um, do you think that there's going to be a lot of um, amendments added to contracts now that are already existing, but the events are delayed? And, and, you know, especially if we don't know what's going on. So for example, if somebody wants to have a conference in September, but you know, let's negotiate now, but we need an addendum in there for the force majeure to continue or something else comes up. Do, uh, you know, I know that a lot of venues aren't great at wanting to put in addendum, but what do you, what is your thought on that? Oh, I wish I had a crystal ball. <laughs> <laughs> I think we all do, right? Um, I, what I'm reading, and please know that I am in a very privileged spot that I haven't, I haven't had a client that needs to cancel. Mm -hmm. Because I have downsized my planning business, I have two, and, and we just squeak through at the end of February with our large event for the end of the, for this calendar year. Um, but my sense is that there are some radical changes being requested. It's not just a simple lift and shift um, of the contract, um, that there are new contracts being created. Um, there are contracts coming back with, you know, a page long force majeure clause. Um, you know, there's going to be different rates in place, um, perhaps different concessions being offered. Um, I think there are some that have experienced a great um, process of, of lifting and shifting an event. Um, and I think there are others that have really had to struggle um, to have an equitable kind of replacement event. Um, I think probably some of them, if they've had a rebooking clause already in their contract that may have facilitated some of that, you know, uh, ability to shift their event. Um, but uh, right now, my sense, and, and I'm on you know, so many planner uh, groups in, in social media. Um, right now, I think it's, it's a bit of a mixed bag and I, I really don't know how it'll play out. Um, I think it, our industry is built on relationship mm -hmm. and uh, a lot of it is coming down to, um, you know, that. Uh, and yet, in some cases, the people that we have relationships aren't even there right now to do the negotiations with a lot of employees, a lot of our salespeople, a lot of, you know, CSMs are furloughed. Um, and yeah. so we're not even able to get to the people that we have a relationship with to be able to negotiate. So. Right. I mean, I think, I, I think we're potentially, you know, particularly from the hotel side, but a, a variety of venues, we're, we're going to be looking at a different industry uh, when they come back to the table and start mm -hmm. thinking again, because their, their economics have, greatly change, right? The people are going to change. Um, and I don't know what the hotels are going to do about their calculus of risk and occupancy, et cetera, because this is now it's a new ball game for them. For sure. And, and, and none of us, it's not like, you know, uh, SARS, it's not like 9-11, um, where there was a period of adjustment, but then things kind of came back online. This is a complete decimation of what we know currently, and how is it going to come back, and who is going to be able to come back? Um, you know, are the same roles going to exist? Um, you know, i um, I know we were talking, I'm part of a, an association of independent event planners, so we all own our own businesses. And even just talking about, you know, the ones that, that have longevity, that have, you know, are able to sustain through, a, through this, you know, who is going to be left on the other side of this to work with? Um, so yeah, I, I don't know, I, I wish I had some better insight and I know that uh, I'm trying to listen all the time as to what is happening to guide people. Um, you know, I, I have some suspicions about, you know, we're going to be looking at, part of me says, are, are venues going to be, you know, um, offering such great incentives to come back to their properties or are properties going to be offering, you know, they're going to be so tight that, that they're going to increase um, and they're going to, you know, offer less things and more expensive and tighter restrictions and things like that. Like part of me says, you know, which way is it going to go? Um, and I, I wish I knew the answer to that because um, that's how contracts are going to have to move, right? Yeah. Um, it, uh, are they going to come back so rigid and we're going to have to just live with them or are there is there going to be room for negotiating so that we can get people back in into venues again um you know I, yeah i have a principle of negotiations i also use in the contracting drafting context and i always say the person who can't walk away loses right yes so what what's going to be interesting and we don't know yet is where's the leverage going to be 
when we come out on the other side of it, right? Is it going to be, there's going to be so many events that want the space that the venues get to say yes and no, or there are going to be fewer events in which case, you know, because people have canceled, delayed, shifted, moved forward, whatever. And so there's not as many events when this reboots. Yeah. Uh, so that then the power's in the events side. And that's probably going to have a long-term impact, right? So because, you know, how these contracts work is they usually keep getting moved forward, as you say. And so whatever happens in the next six months to a year may have impacts kind of over the next decade or two decades. Absolutely. And, and some of the things that I think about are, are how are events themselves going to change and how are those going to be reflected in the contract? So things like uh, food service, things like sanitation and hygiene, how are we going, what are we going to expect to see in contracts that address how venues are addressing those concerns? Um, and what are we going to have to know? Um, you know, uh, what is the food service standard going to be like? What is the staff training around hygiene? What are the cleaning protocols? You know, what, how how do you sanitize the fitness facility? Like all of those questions are going to be top of mind because as meeting planners, we have to show duty of care to our clients and attendees. Exactly. Um, and we're going to be looking to our venues um, to uh, give us those assurances. And we're going to want those in the contract because we have to have something that we can leverage if those assurances aren't met. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, even even that, like it's chicken and egg, what's going to come first? Are we going to create the, the event of the future and then contract to that? Or are we going to get into a position where we are contracting with the old world, but then encountering new issues when we have new events? So, um, yeah, it's it's all top of mind, really. Um, yeah. It's yeah. going to be a leap. Sorry. Yeah, I think you've opened up, like you say, there's a whole new set of deal points to come in there, you know, and one thing that popped in my head while you were talking about, about the sanitation and the, the food safety and, you know, another one's access points, right? You know, because yeah. now a lot of conferences are talking about potentially taking people's temperatures as they come in there, screening for people who might have illnesses, right? So, you know, venues where you can just kind of flow in and out, you know, you need your badge to get in the conference room or whatever, but largely you can move around the hotel wherever you want. Yeah, it may not be as desirable now in the future, right? You may need to get single or you know maybe one or two or three access points where people can come in and out. Yeah, you do these kind of screenings. Yeah, and and even things like uh, all of the marketing specs are, are is that going to change because the capacity of what a room can hold? We were I was just in a group chat this morning and about talking about you know we we used to put 125 people in a space that hold held 80 kind of thing, right? And right. and so now it's going to be well that space that held 80 is now going to hold 40 right. um, because people yeah. aren't going to contract for that kind of squishiness that we had grown accustomed to. Um, banquet rounds of 10 might now be banquet rounds of five, and like there's just all sorts of kind of logistics that we need to think about and and our venues going to you know are we going to have to rent double the amount of space for half the amount of people are we you know and how are the costs going to to be reflected and um so it really truly um yeah it's just such an unknown um and interesting um you know i i also one of the things that uh I think about the the venues are going to want more known and we as event hosts are going to want more unknown we're going to want you know flexibility and yet venues are going to want written you know uh, we need these kinds of minimums and yet we're going to say we don't know what our new events are going to look like you know our, our four or five year ten year history of our events really don't mean anything anymore so how do we calibrate what our what our spend is going to be how do we justify our room block how do we justify our food and beverage minimum you know it, all of those kinds of concerns and how do we contract conservatively uh, and you know and then be held for something that's unknown um you know and, and what kind of damages are we going to see because of of you know taking you know, hopefully it's better than throwing a dart at the wall and saying, okay, a food and beverage minimum of $100,000. But what if we really only can meet 60? Yeah. Um, what, how are those attritions and all of that kind of thing going to play out? And what kind of standards are we going to be held to after this? Um, because venues are going to want to recover financially and they deserve to and we want them to. Um, but who, who is who's going to hold that? Um, so. And there was a couple of things that I was thinking of while you were, while we've been talking about all of this is, you know, a lot of times when you have booked a venue and you go for your site check, you don't necessarily get to see the back end. No. So you don't get to see the kitchen area. I always try to, 
Yeah. But you don't get to see the kitchen area where if you're having a buffet or you're having a plated service, you know, you want to know what the their protocol is in the back. The other thing that brought to mind as well is, um, and I'm going to think about it and it just went out of my mind, it always happens, um, is in regards to as an independent planner, and you and I are both independent planners, does our contracts have to change? Yes. You know, yes, there's, there's... in regards to all of this, and I've had I've had a big event in Cuba canceled um, yeah. because of legislation in the U.S. And we had written in our supplier contracts as well as mine because we knew it was a possibility we may have to cancel. And that cancellation clause is still in my contracts; it doesn't move. Um, the other thing is, you were talking about the attrition and the F and B minimums. Um, we all know that when we hold a conference, people will register two weeks before. Yeah. And, and your cutoff is usually 30 days before. So we know that this is now going to change and people are going to go, no, I'm going to wait for a week before because I don't know what's going to happen in the environment. Yeah. I think it's going to take a really collaborative, uh, really, um, purposeful, if I can say that, purposeful way to mm -hmm. regain ground back in the events industry. And it's going to take both partners being willing to to really come to the table prepared to say we need to rebuild and we need to, you know, get this up and rooming, uh, get this engine that is the hospitality industry up and moving again. And it's going to take some flexibility on the venue side and it's going to take some flexibility on the event host side to really find what's going to work. Um, but yet, contracts are binding by law and so how do you you know how do you create how do you protect yourself yeah um, I mean, it's hard to anticipate every possible scenario COVID yes. being the prime example right a lot of people yes. you know Deirdre and I've had this conversation people thought about hurricanes they thought yes. about floods they thought about a lot of these localized type things that could happen and not a lot of people were thinking about something that would completely shut down travel yeah yes you know, eventually it would lead to these state orders and provincial orders that you can't host events. I mean, so a lot of that's unanticipated. But now we have a much bigger, you know, game set. I think people are now thinking more about what happens in a cancellation. And, and the economics are, are huge, right? Because, you know, you have the event planning part, the services of yourself and Deirdre, right? You guys do the work up front, whether the event happens or not, you did the work. Yeah. Um, you know, you have, at some point you start making collateral for the conference, right? Your banners, your signs, right? The person who prints the signs, well, they're printing the signs, right? If, yeah. if you get close enough to the event, and I think a lot of people maybe are gonna try to delay on that and you're more reliable sponsors, uh, suppliers so that you can, you know, maybe hit the print button closer to the event date rather than well in advance. Um, but, you know, there's, and what needs to happen is a conversation about this allocation of loss, right? I mean, that's really what we're trying to do in a contract is figure out where do these costs go? And I think this forces a lot of conversations that were swept under the rug before. Yes. Yeah, for yeah. sure. Who takes the loss? Does the venue take the loss or does the conference take the loss if you don't use the space, right? The money's gone, right? If the conference doesn't happen, there's just not the money, right? So either the event's going to take the loss for the unused space or the venue's going to take the loss for the unused space. And you know, same with the speakers, right? You know, a lot of the speakers are like, you know, do yes. I get paid or do I not get paid? When I, you know, I was, I booked the time, I didn't take other conferences and then you yes. canceled the conference, right? Yeah. Um, you know, so somebody's got to take the hit and I think there's going to, it's going to really, the industry's got to really have a conversation about how do we allocate these costs. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I wish I had an answer and I, it's for uh, people that are smarter than I am, <laughs> for sure, to really, you know, address that. Um, it, uh, yeah, I, I, I'm concerned about how, how things will play out and, and what the industry will look like when we come back. Although I actually just did see in, in one of those kind of, you, you look for those bright uh, spots in all of this. Um, I did just see this morning that uh, um, some big group is going ahead in in September and I mean they're they're moving forward in faith that they will be able to meet but they've already said we are putting you know rigorous sanitation and you know guidelines in place yeah. um, and so I think it's going to take some of some of us um, as on the event side to really you know take that leap of faith and say we'll do everything we can to keep people 
keep people safe. You know, one of the things that's being talked about is more regional. Can we drive? Yeah. Can we travel locally? Can we, you know, and then hooking together to make a, a big conglomerate event, but it's a lot of smaller local uh, regional events. And so who's to know? I, um, yeah, I really, I, yeah, I don't know how it's going to play out. I wish I had yeah. answers. <laughs> I don't think anybody has answers. No. I think that's why we've, you know, um, we're having these discussions yeah, because get... it's the possibilities. Well, even of what uh, can happen. absolutely, and and even uh, I know I heard um, one somebody, and I wish I could give credit where it was due, um, was saying about the digital twinning of events. So maybe it's a smaller event for those that are comfortable attending in person, but there's an equivalent equal program that's offered virtually. That um, and so some of the silver lining is that some of our events are reading reaching audiences that are double, triple, quadruple mm -hmm. what they would have met in person. Um, you know, headcount wise and impact wise, and. So so maybe it's moving forward, you know, in a different, it's a different way. I, I don't think if face-to-face -face events are ever going to go away. No. I know for myself, a month in the house and I am craving, I want to go hug my neighbor, right? Like, <laughs> like we, I think we're always going to have that, but uh, um, it's just how it's going to look um, and how we, con my concern is how will we contract and how do we advise um, yeah. contract, you know, clients to contract uh, moving forward. But yeah. I think for us, we have to see a contract come to us first, right? Yeah. And what's it going to look like? Exactly. Yeah. And we've got that. You talked about the digital component. We actually did talk about that yesterday, where you oh. could have regional on the east, central, and west coast, and then bring everyone together on a virtual level. But then you've got additional components that would go into your AV contract. Exactly. And, and, and the cost of that is not, I heard of just uh, someone that, that did a virtual trade show and we're talking five digits, yeah. you know, like it's still not an inexpensive option, right? Like the costs are still there and can event hosts support those costs, um, you know, our sponsors and all of that kind of stuff. So are they going to come back on board because the experience is different? So, well, and the sponsors as well, because, you know, right now with corporate, um, uh, realigning or reassessing their corporate business model because you know that's what they're doing um, and their events the sponsorship dollars might not be there for events at this time they may not even honor the ones that they've um, uh, you know said they would later in the year because of what's happening right now yeah and it, you know that that just that's uh, just to tie it back to something she said earlier you know, with the changed sanitation, the changed health, the changed expectations, I, I can see the I can see the possibility of somebody uh, a venue coming back and saying, "Hey, we're just we can't we can't do the contract we made with you before, right?" So there may be events now that have have plans for the fall, September, October, November, and where the venue just says, "Hey, it's no longer practical, right? I can't." I can't do all the sanitation necessary. I can't do all the health upgrades, mm. all the things that are necessary to have your event in the fall. So we may see, we may still be seeing some lingering cancellations and using of the old contracts while we're starting to think about negotiating the new contracts. I mean, I can see that going both ways. Yeah, and will and will those um, let's say those stan sanitation protocols? Yeah, will they be um, let's say industry wide? So will the, the larger hotel chains and, and convention centers, will they all kind of have the same type of sanitation protocols? Yeah. Because um, it would be really nice if, if it was the same across the board. I, I, but, I, 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 but that's I, not going to be the same animal. <laughs> well, no, I, can, I can tell you as a lawyer, they likely will, because what they'll want to do from a liability perception standpoint, if I'm going to put my glasses on and look at the future, if the hotel industry can come up with this global standard of what sanitation is, mm -hmm. they all they all do it. Then if somebody sues them, they can say, oh, we, we comply with the global standard. We comply with it. Hmm. Right. Yeah, that's a good From idea. From a liability actually. standpoint, protection is always good if you have like a agreed standard and they can say, oh, well, we did what the industry does. Because industry standard is one of the things that courts will look at in right. a liability suit. It's did you comply with industry standards? So that's something to be very careful about two in the future is will the will the industry try to write standards that are more favorable to them so that you know they can comply with them 
Making a note of that. Yes, <laughs> Making a note of that, right, Heather? Yeah. The level, the level yeah. of sanitation that you want as an event host may be higher than the industry standard. Right. And it would be. And it would be, for sure. So, so I think that's something, you know, if you want to be a leader and you want to set the right tone and you want to say, I'm doing my events the right way, you may want to say, this is our sanitation standard. This is what we expect for our guests rather than just saying, let the hotel say, I'm complying with the industry standard or I'm complying right. with the norms. Yeah. Yeah, there's so there's so many uh, things that we're going to have to be more strategic about as an industry on our side as the planner event host side is, is truly, um, you know, getting back to some of those core fundamental foundational parts of our job, which is contracts for one. Mm -hmm. um, and I've, I've been very vocal in the past and will continue to be, um, you know, I, I did a, I, and this is Canadian. Um, I did an environmental scan of all of our postgraduate courses in event planning. Um, so university slash colleges. And four years ago, there wasn't a single post-secondary institution that did a full course on contracts and no contract way. negotiations wow. in an event management program. Yeah. And yet what we all know to be true is that a contract is the first stage of every single component of an event sure. from a speaker to decor to catering to marketing to registration systems to your venue to AV company everything has a contract associated with it huh. and so part of what I see coming out of all of this um, is going back to basics and yeah. really saying do we have core competencies and one of them is contract knowledge and and literacy in contracts yeah. um, another one is risk management um, and how do we you know how do we show and how do we demonstrate to our clients that we know what risk management is and what does it look like what about crisis communications too right like we as event yeah. planners are are charged quite often with leading um, the crisis communications for an event, not necessarily the corporate or the client, but for the event itself. Okay. Um, and so some of those real core competencies I see as being a really good thing coming out of this. Um, and, and when a crisis happens on our side, we have to go, uh oh, and we have to really, th and I've had it happen where I've got to think real fast and go, okay, what am I going to do? Right. And, and within like a 24 hour period or less, you've got to have something in place and in a lot of times as i said before we don't have a crisis communication plan in place because we don't know what's going to happen and so it's it's really having to be strategic and think but I, quickly but I, I would say deirdre though that i would say you know just because we don't have a pandemic one doesn't mean that we can't have crisis communications well, exactly. model right. in place to then say okay what is appropriate for the pandemic that maybe wasn't appropriate for the earthquake or right. well, you know or the, the the flood or whatever um but the the principles of it are similar and and all of that mm -hmm. and i would say with the contracts and that's where my love is and and i would say the same with the contract is that you know how how are we showing our clients and showing our um you know demonstrating our really good core basic thorough knowledge of contracts um, and I think you know uh, the contracts that people are dealing with now that have you know some of them don't even have force majeure clauses no. or language in them or if they do they are very much swayed and and in favor of the venue to such a high standard as you said uh, Sean about um, you know the standard of impossibility versus impracticability um, you know and and those that that know those differences and and how just little words can be nuanced to, to have completely different meaning they may seem innocuous <laughs> they may seem to be like oh that's a, yeah I'm okay with that um, and yet they have very powerful um, teeth well, behind we've them. Had yeah. a, we've, had a couple, we've had a couple litigations in the U.S. over a comma. Um, yeah. Where, oh, wow. Where, you know, like if you have if you have a list, right, and then you place the comma, there's actually litigation for overtime pay, and because of how they placed the comma, more people got overtime pay than what they initially, what some people thought, and they had a whole wow. lawsuit over whether you know who who was included in a group entitled to the pay based on where the comma was placed, and so. That just tells you the detail you can get. And I'll tell you, yeah. in litigation, we, we dig through contracts, we read every word, and we figure out what it means, right? Yeah. So, um, 
better to do it on the front end to yes. find who comb it, get the right words in there, know exactly what you're agreeing to. And so I think you're right, Mother. I think, you know, there's an era coming where people are going to be more focused on the fundamentals. Yeah. In a perfect world, your contract should just embody what your agreement is. It just, I find a lot of times people with contracts, they don't do the work to fully flush out the agreement, right? They just kind of agree on the surface. Yeah, we're going to be there. We'll be there September 9th to 13th. We need these conference rooms. Great. Give me a contract. You know, you know I, about what happens if the event doesn't happen. What right. Now, well, and I, I don't know about you, but I know I avoid things I don't know. Right. I avoid things I don't understand. And I think, you know, in, in fairness to, you know, we're super, super busy as a profession, typically, um, we like to avoid things that we don't understand. And a lot of legalese is stuff that we just don't understand. Yeah. And so, you know, we tend to say, oh, well, it'll work out. Um, and I think those days are gone. And I, yeah. I, I really, truly believe that, you know, the, the hyper focus. Now, I'm already ahead of that in saying, I just hope we don't get back to a complacency anytime soon um, that we don't, you know, um, trust that now this whole new wave of contracts, well, that's going to cover everything because we still have to be just as vigilant um, and can be assured that our partner sides are going to be incredibly vigilant moving forward. And we have to be prepared to be just as vigilant, just as savvy and invest in expert in expert counsel, expert legal counsel, expert planner counsel, whatever that might take to get to a place um, that, that uh, you know, you're, you, can, you can rest on that contract protecting you. Yeah, Heather, you have tremendous knowledge of this and really appreciate you sharing with us. Why don't you tell us where folks can find you, check out your stuff and get in touch with you. Hi, they can find me at plannerprotect.ca. And uh, yeah, my email is simple, it's Heather at plannerprotect.ca. Um, yeah, I'm here to, to help. I, I truly, and Deirdre knows this, I'm, I'm not about, I mean, I have it on my website, I'm not about building dependency on me. I really, truly started this business with a legacy piece of moving our industry forward. And I want to create someone else's um, efficacy, their own professional practice being really up-leveled by taking the responsibility of really knowing what they're doing with contracts. Um, and so it's about, for me, it's about the education. It's about, yeah, sure, doing contract reviews. That's the part I love. I love getting into a contract. Um, I know it's strange, right? Okay. Um, but it's, it's a, at the end of the day, it's about protecting the client, the event host, because it's awful. What, what groups are going through right now is just yeah. horrific. Um, yeah. And it's for the sake of words, Really, when it comes down to it, it's for the sake of words that could have been so different. So, yeah, Heather at plannerprotect.ca. Be great. Thank you. Thank you for helping us with our mission. We're trying to get the industry together to collect ideas, to figure out what's happening next, to get people uh, wiser. And I think you've added a ton of value on the con. Uh, well, thank you. We have, we have a pause button right now, don't we? And I, I just, I, I think we've shown, I think our whole industry shows their true colors when, when we just literally lock arms and say, we're going to get through this and we're That's all right. going to be better for it because I can't do my business without the venues and our partners, our amazing partners, and they can't do what they're here to do without us. So really, truly, it's going to be both of us you know, coming up the side of the wall and uh, getting over it together. So thank you so much, Sean, for the privilege. And thank you, Deirdre, for the privilege. I am just honored to be, to be asked. Thank you. Thank you for uh, sharing with us, Heather. It's really important that we all collaborate and share. And, and that's why we're bringing um, yourself and other people in the industry together so that you can share what your thoughts are for the possibilities of the future. Super. Well, I look forward to watching the rest of the broadcast too. So, yep. so folks, Thank make you. sure you tune in regularly. Make sure you're following Sean McBride, myself, Deirdre Watson, Best in Events YouTube channel. We'll be bringing you a whole series of videos digging into what's happening with meeting and events and what the future is going to look like. So make sure you subscribe, make sure you follow us along because we'll be bringing you more and send us your questions and ideas because we want to tailor the content to you. So thanks for being here today and thanks Heather. Bye.